I want to thank Brother Lord for reading that scripture reading this morning. Of course, that's not what I'm going to preach on this morning, but I thought it'd be a good scripture for us to start the lesson out with. I want to speak on prayer this morning. I usually hear, haven't heard a whole lot of lessons on prayer, but you know we have a tremendous amount of scriptures on prayer. And as we go over this morning, I hope you enjoy it, that it may present it in a way that be pleasing unto you. It says, though prayer is unquestionable, one of the most effective tools in our spiritual arsenal, it may also be most neglected. And I, I for one, know I neglect prayer. And I don't know whether you all neglect it or not. How many times do you pray a day? Do you keep a prayer in your heart as you travel? Prayer certainly occupied a prominent place in the life of Jesus. Let's look at Matthew 14, 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up in the, on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. So we find here that when Christ decided to pray, he went up on a mountain alone, didn't he? So when we decide to pray, if we're by ourselves, we can pray alone. We don't have to have an audience to pray. And we need to pray a lot of times alone. Let's turn to Mark, the 14th chapter. Mark 14. And let's start at verse 32. Then they came to a place which is named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the air might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came to the third time, said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. So we find here as Christ was in the garden here, asking God to not let him be crucified on the cross. But God didn't answer his prayer there, did he? He still had to go and be crucified. But he prayed before he did, and he prayed to God, and he, and, he, and he tells us to pray. We need to pray. In verse 38 it says, watch and pray, lest you enter to, into temptation. So when we start to enter into temptation, into temptation, we need to watch and pray. And that's, that's the way as God, Christ told the apostles here. <coughs> Before naming the twelve apostles, Christ went to a mountain to pray, and he prayed all night. Let's look at Luke, the sixth chapter, 12 through 13. Luke 6, 12 through 13. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out of the mountain to pray out to the mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, from whom he named the apostles. So we find here that when Christ went up here to pray, that when he come back from praying, that then he named the twelve apostles. So he was ready 
to name the twelve apostles. On occasion, the Lord sought to provide his disciples with specific instruction on how they could improve their as this aspect of the spiritual life. Turn with me to Matthew 6, chapter 5 through 13. <coughs> this is what they call the, the model prayer. It says that when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Then your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore pray. For Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now we can't use your kingdom come in a prayer because the kingdom is already here. So we could leave that out of this prayer if we want to pray this prayer here. It says, O oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we find here, as we pray to God, we can ask him to give us our daily bread. We also can ask him to forgive us our debts as we forgive those debts to others. And we can ask him not to lead us into temptation. And to deliver us from the evil one. In one of his parables, Christ expressed purpose of encouraging his followers to pray at all times and not lose heart. Luke 18, 1. Let's look at Luke 18, 1 here. It says, Then he spake a parable to them that man always ought to pray and not lose heart. As we find here in this parable here, we want to look at this parable. We find a woman here who uh, was being neglected by the judge. And uh, he failed to supply her needs, so she just kept coming back. So let's read this parable here. So he's, uh, then he spake a parable to them that man always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain city, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city. She came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continually coming this, she worry me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry one out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So we find here that when we cry out to God in prayer, he's going to avenge his enemy. So we need to remember that prayer is an important link to us with God. Our prayer should be like this woman. We should not give up. We may accomplish what we pray for if we don't give up. If we just say, say a prayer and disregard it and go on, not think about saying another prayer, then we've given up. In the beginning of the church, the apostles continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, in Breaking of Bread, and in Prayer, Acts 2.42. We can read also in Acts 6, 1 through 7. Let's turn over there, if you would, and let's read about the Hellenist widows here that were being neglected. See what uh, 
apostles told them to do. Acts 6. One through seven years. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists against their widows because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve some of the multitude of the disciples was said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the said pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we find here that the apostles told them to appoint seven men here to take care of the widows here because they wanted to continue in prayer and ministry of the word. They didn't have time to wait on people that other people could take care of. Just like we need to do today in the church, we need to make sure those that are in need are taken care of. We need to give over time. When Peter was arrested, the church in Jerusalem came together to pray fervently on his behalf. God delivered Peter. Let's turn with me to Acts, the 12th chapter. Let's read about this. Acts 12, beginning at verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but custom prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when the herd was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. And then behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and the light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what, that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod from all the expectations of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. So we find here that the people here were praying fervently for Peter that he might be released. That God may re re release him from prison. And he did. He answered their prayers. But we know that Peter couldn't stay here in his, with Mary's house because the, you know the Herod was sending his soldiers there to try to find him. So he, so he departed there and went to another place. 
But we find that the, the apostles and the people in those days prayed fervently for, for Peter and for each other. The Christian in both Rome and Colossae were instructed to be devote to have devoted to prayer, to be devoted to prayer. Let's look at Colossians 1, 9 through 12. It says, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patient and long-suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So we find here Paul writing to the brethren at Colossians, was thankful that they heard that they'd obeyed the gospel and they did not cease to pray for them. Just like today, we need to pray for our brethren in other churches, wherever they may be that's in need or need our help and need our prayer. As Paul was talking about the whole armor of God in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, he told the brethren in verse 18, praying always and with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. As Paul was writing to the church at Philippi in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we find here that when we pray to God with thanksgiving, we're to let God know our requests, give God a request, what we have need of. Those at Thessalonica were to pray without season. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Of course we know that we're not, we can't pray without stopping sometime, can we? He said pray without season. Now let's look at some of the Old Testament prayers that was given. We want to look especially at the prayer that Hannah, Hannah made to God which resulted in her having a son by the name of Samuel. Turn with me to 1 Samuel, start at verse 8 through 18. Then Elkadiah, her husband, said to Hannah, Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drank it in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on this seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened that she continued praying before the Lord that Eli washed her mouth. And Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicated drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken unto now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So we find here as she prayed to God fervently that God answered her prayer. He gave her a son. And his name was Samuel.
In Proverbs 15, 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to, to the Lord's, but the, pro, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So we find here that the abomination of the wicked is the prayer of the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. So God delights in our prayers when we pray to him. It says, Evening and morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Psalms 55, 17. 1 Timothy 2, 8. I desire therefore that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without, without wrath and doubting. So what's Paul telling Timothy here? He desired all men to pray everywhere. Lift him up, holy hands without wrath and without doubting. When we pray, we're not to doubt, are we? We're not supposed to doubt God. Turn with it to Ephesians 1, 15 through 19. Ephesians, the first chapter. It says here, the prayer for spiritual wisdom here. Therefore, I also, after I hear of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all these things, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mission of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, in the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the work of his mighty power? Paul here praying to the Ephesians. He said, do not give thanks. Do not, he said, I do not get, cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. He was making the mention of the Ephesians in his prayers when he prayed for them. Let's turn to Philippians 1, 8 through 11. <clears throat> Philippians 1, 8 through 11. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, <coughs> being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So we find here that Paul prayed in Philippians that their love may abound and they may have more knowledge. Turn with me to Colossians, verse 1, chapter 1. 9 through 12. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the thanks in the light. So if Paul wrote to the Colossians here, we need to give thanks to the Father and we do that through prayer. For we are now inheritance of the saints of light. Not the saints of darkness, but the saints of light. Now let's look at a few things here. We are told how we are to pray. Pray at times alone. We are told to pray here at times alone. We are alone. We are told to pray at all times and not lose heart. We are told to continue steadfastly in prayer. We are to be devoted to prayer. As we travel through life, we are devoted to prayer. Need to ask God for forgiveness of our mistakes and our sins. Need to pray for the sick. Pray for those that preach God's word. And pray without doubting. 
When we pray to God, we need to realize that we need we are not to doubt God's word, that He will answer our prayers. Of course, it says pray in the morning, pray in the noon, and pray in the evening. Do we do that? If we keep these reasons for prayer, we'll always keep our minds on God. So I'd like to remind you that when we go home, or when we're everywhere, where we're at, that remember to pray. Put our trust in God and keep Him in our will and in our mind. So we can pray as we walk down the road, as we travel, wherever we're at. We can, you can always pray. You don't have to pray out loud. You can pray silently. We need to always keep God in the heart as we pray. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a member of the church, you haven't obeyed God through baptism, through hearing His Word, believing His Word and hearing it, repenting of your sins and confessing Him before man, and being baptized for remission of your sins, we ask you to come this time. That's why together we stand in the second.